So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this evening we have uh, Dr. Harish Rao, Assistant Professor of Clinical Pediatrics and Associate Director, Pediatric Sleep Program uh, at the Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis, USA. Uh, very happy to tell you that Dr. Harish Rao was uh, did his residency here in PGI and then moved on to United States of America. And he's become a sleep specialist there, and he's going to be talking about sleep in children, architecture, regulation, and physiology. Uh, Dr. Harish Rao, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, it's a pleasure to be um, back in PGI, though virtually. Um, I was in Chandigarh a few years ago and had the opportunity to see the new APC and then interact with uh, some of the residents, and uh, of course, uh, appreciate. Uh, Dr. Singh's um, invite. So thank you for inviting me. So um, I've been at Riley for at least two years now. Before that, I was in Penn State. And um, all, you know, because we'll just get started as uh, have a lot to talk about. Can I um, have a screen sharing? Um, I think it's blocking screen share. I think you've connected again. So. I think you can screen share now because we disconnected in between. So. Okay, perfect. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. So, uh, you know, the long-term goal of these talks is to get you all interested in sleep medicine, though I have a different sort of short-term objectives for this talk. So today I'm gonna to talk about sleep in children, give you an overview, uh, talk about architecture, regulation, and physiology. So we're gonna talk about, you know, how we can define sleep, why we sleep, control regulation, architecture, what happens to our breathing during sleep and what are the effects of sleep deprivation? And we're gonna talk about what is, should be normal sleep in children. So you know, one of the things that always intrigued us was what role does sleep do uh, function in our day-to-day uh, you know, -day life? You know, why is it even important to get sleep? So uh, one of the gurus in sleep medicine, uh, Alan Chaplin, who actually, uh, the pioneer in sleep staging. Uh, I always remember this quote, if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function, that is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. So I you know, think about this every day. So people have struggled to define sleep because there are a lot of different things that happen in sleep. So um, there is no grand unified definition, but we can something that we can come close to is that Sleep is a complex reversible state characterized by behavioral presence, um, you know, reduced responsiveness to external stimuli. So, but a lot more happens during sleep uh, than we are aware of. Um, we are know that there's restorative and somatic growth that occurs during sleep. And people have tried to explain during using different theories as to why sleep is important and what are the things happening during sleep. So of course, during the somatic growth theory, there is facilitation of anabolic process. And we know that growth hormone release occurs mostly in N3 sleep and not much during when we are awake. And also the metabolic theory, where is regulation of body temperature, energy conservation, removal of toxins generated during wakefulness. And of course, you know, back in the days when we were hunter and gatherers, you know, we had to protect ourselves from predators. So who are active at night. So one of the best ways to hide from them, either on the trees or in caves and you know, get some rest. And we know that our immune system does not function well if you don't sleep well. So again, you know, it's important for protecting ourselves. And um, we know that I think sleep is important for neural growth and processing. Uh, there is a lot of uh, brain activity that happens, occurs during sleep. There's development, uh, restoration of connections, learning, memory consolidation. One of the newer things that we learned is that there's an active lymphatic system in the brain. There's a slow convective flow of CSF from this uh, subarachnoid space through the interconnectional 
neuronal spaces into the parovenous uh, system. And this system, you know, removes some of the metabolites or the toxins, uh, so to speak, that accumulate when we're awake and helps kind of clean up the, the brain and, you know, or let you rejuvenate or reset you for the next day. And this we know because there are experiments that were done in rats looking at, you know, for a microscopy. As you can see in this picture, there's uh, on the panel on the left, these interstitial spaces are really narrow when the rat is awake and then they get wider when the rat is sleeping. Clearly, the brain is not fully sleeping when we sleep. Brain is active and doing a lot of things when um, we are actually sleeping. So you can imagine, uh, a cleaning lady coming to your brain every night and cleaning up your brain, clearing all the toxins and metabolites and help you kind of clean up for the next day. So uh, the glymphatic system peaks during sleep. So this explains, you know, what happens uh, during sleep. And the sleep probably removes all the biological waste from the CNS, such as the beta amyloid, accumulation of which is known to cause uh, Alzheimer's. And there's a clear relationship between short sleep duration and increased risk of um, uh, brain disorders such as Alzheimer's and dementia. So clearly there seems a very good correlation between what we are learning about what happens during sleep and the clinical correlates of it. Looking at sleep regulation, you know, there's no single sleep center in the brain. Um, there are multiple centers that participate and you know, collaborate. There's different neurotransmitters, just serotonin, GABA, stalcholine. Of course, we have the master uh, circadian rhythm system that is from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. From our studies, we now know that you know the our internal circadian rhythm is not just the 24-hour cycle; it's actually a little bit more than 24. It's 24.3 or 24.5, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus helps us, uh, you know, adjust to the 24-hour clock that we have set for ourselves to function in this world. Um, we now know that there is a new system called the orexin hypoperin that is produced by the hypothalamus that is important for sleep and wakefulness. And of course, you know, the role of melatonin that is produced by the pineal gland is also equally important. So, you know, look at regulation of sleep. There are two intrinsic processes. One is the sleep-wake homeostasis process. One is the circadian rhythm process. These are the two intrinsic systems that work in our body to help us maintain the sleep-wake cycle. Of course, there are a lot of external factors such as, you know, our work uh, hours, you know, doing a night shift, our food, drink, you know, drugs, temperature, stress, social factors, you know, staying up late, uh, watching a movie or playing video games. So a lot of those external factors also come in and play a role in changing our sleep-wake cycle. We're looking the deeper uh, into this two process model, which is the either the process S or the process C. So the process S, as I maintained, is the, as I said, is the sleep homeostasis. So this is a process that keeps track of how much time has passed since you've been awake or asleep. So when you wake up at seven in the morning, the, this homeostatic sleep drive is low. And as time passes, this increases. Um, so, and, uh, and at bedtime, this um, uh, this process is high, helps you fall asleep very easily, and then it reduces as you know the time passes uh, during sleep. Um, and adenosine is a neurotransmitter that regulates this homeostatic sleep drive. And looking at the circadian rhythm process, this keeps track of time irrespective of what happens in the environment. So regardless of what time it is, you have a circadian rhythm. And this is what happens, you know, with jet lag. So when you travel east or west, you're still in the old circadian process and it takes time for your body to adjust. So this clock keeps track, track of what happens in your system internally, regardless of what's happening outside. And it takes time to adjust to the new system. And that's when how it happens when you overcome the jet lag. So give you an overview of, you know, different uh, process, different uh, neurotransmitter systems that process or uh, help control sleep. Um, looking at uh, the different neurotransmitters that work in different stages uh, of wakefulness and sleep, you know, during wakefulness, um, there are several process, you know, CNS centers that work, uh, the neurotransmitters being serotonin, histamine, 
dopamine, acetylcholine, or rexin. So knowing this uh, neurotransmitter is helpful to uh, you know, come up with medication that helps you stay awake during the day. For example, you know, uh, the modafinil or Concerta or uh, those medications help in staying awake and this is helpful in, you know, in patients with narcolepsy. Similarly, uh, for non-REM sleep, uh, we have the VLPO hypothalamus, which is the brain, and they produce GABA or galanin, and uh, GABA is increased by barbitrate rates uh, and benzodiazepine. So now we know why these medications have a sedative effect because they increase GABA. Similarly, rapid eye movement have different system, nervous systems that play a role, uh, the PPT and the LDT. Uh, and glycine, as we know, is the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter that actually causes the muscle atonia in REM sleep. Orexin uh, is relatively newly discovered uh, neurotransmitter that is produced by uh, hypothalamus. Uh, it's important in maintaining sleep and wakefulness stages. And loss of these neurons uh, causes reduced orexin production, and which causes narcolepsy. The REM is fascinating in that is the REM on-off switch uh, that switches off from going to REM and coming off or out of REM. Uh, and we're still not sure as to how the system, you know, what it turns it on, what turns it off. And there's a lot more to be learned. But another important aspect of the uh, REM sleep is the REM atonia, which is more uh, Mod modulated by the glycine um, connecting to the spinal interneurons, which then produce the muscle atonia that we are familiar with the REM sleep. So um, adenosine is interesting uh, because adenosine um, raise, starts raising the moment we wake up and increases and accumulates in the basal forebrain in the cortex and reaches peak when, when we are able to fall asleep. So adenosine, is important for increasing or building that sleep drive. And you are all familiar with what happens at adenosine when you drink coffee, you know, which has caffeine, which inhibits adenosine. So um, I, it, coffee decreases uh, our sleep drive and increases our wakefulness by actually, you know, reducing the adenosine. So um, now we know how coffee helps uh, stays help us stay awake for uh, studying for all those um, exams uh, that we had taken a lot during our lifetime. So um, the supracrasmatic nucleus is the master circadian rhythm generated in mammals. Um, as I said, it's in, it fires independently of the environment and more during the day than at night. And its actions are promotion of wakefulness during the day and consolidation of sleep at night. So it's located uh, close to the optic uh, chiasma and uh, the glutamate is the main neurotransmitter. And for this system, light is the most important uh, source uh, of entrainment. So we talk about entrainment is light entering the eye and in turn entering the system, connects to the external environment and keeps it in sync with the external environment. So light exposure is really important for um, maintaining the circadian rhythm. And this is the problem that we often see in patients who are visually impaired. If their retina is damaged enough that they can't sense this light going into the supracasmic nucleus, then they have difficulty maintaining their circadian rhythm in sync to the external environment. So the supracasmic nucleus has a shell and a core and it gets input from the light system and also from uh, the uh, arousal input coming from the brainstem and it settles an output uh, into our different um, organ organs. So looking at a little bit more about this uh, system in the eye, so there are special ganglion cells that are different from the rods and cones. They are called the intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. They lie in between rods and cones and they have a where a, a a protein called melanopsin that absorbs photons. And these um, then convert into signals into uh, going to the retinal hypothalamic tract that tracks into the supracasmatic nucleus. So this is what helps us, you know, collect light from outside and in, that enters into our circadian rhythm and helps us keep in track of what's happening outside and what's uh, the in and connecting the circadian rhythm that is inside. So, um, as I said, people who are visually impaired may, may or may not have these ganglion cells, and the ones who don't have really difficulty maintaining their circadian rhythm in sync with the external environment. 
Similarly, our body internally has um, different systems that also have a rhythm. For example, you know, looking at growth hormone, the secretion is really low when we're awake, but peaks when we fall asleep. Similarly, we all know about the plasma cortisol, it peaks in the morning, and every system like the temperature, uh, potassium excretion, every system has a circadian rhythm. Knowing this is really important to understand how body systems work and use this to our advantage. For example, you know, knowing cortisol peaks in the morning is the reason why we give a higher dose of a single dose of um, corticosteroid uh, in the morning that coincides with this. So giving it at this time reduces the chance of uh, suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So we all also know that different enzymes work well at different times. So now circadian rhythm medicine is growing so much that um, we can now administer medication at different times, knowing that they work better and they with a lesser dose and they can cause less side effects. It's given at the right time. Uh, similarly, our functioning also uh, changes and we obviously function really well during the day. The, there is a blood pressure, a circadian rhythm, melatonin secretion stops when we wake up. When we wake up in the morning, that's when our bowel movements start. Um, and their bones are suppressed during the night, you know, thankfully. Uh, our alertness is high in the morning, coordination is best, and these are helpful for athletes, you know, when they, uh, when they go for their um, training or go for the competitions where they can give their best um, when their reaction time is the fastest. So during sleep, uh, melatonin secretion starts in the evening and we have the lowest body temperature. So knowing the rhythm is really helpful to get, you know, optimize our functioning during the daytime. Um, of course, we have to talk about melatonin when we talk about sleep. So melatonin uh, is the hormone of darkness. Uh, it has, it is produced from uh, serotonin and then originally from tryptophan. It has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and um, anticoagulopathic activity. It's used for treating circadian rhythm, jet lag disorder, and insomnia. And to tell you, uh, it's actually one of the most abused medication in the United States. It's available over the counter. It, you don't need a prescription. It's not FDA approved. It's considered as a supplement. Though it, you know, it's helpful in circadian rhythm problems and jet lag, people mostly use it for insomnia because it reduces sleep latency, increases sleep efficiency and sleep duration. And knowing how the melatonin works has helped us develop a medication called Tazimeltion which is used in visually impaired patients um, with the, who are unable to maintain their circadian rhythm. So this has, has been uh, somewhat of a blessing for them, you know, helping them maintain their uh, circadian rhythm in sync with the external environment. Speaking at sleep cycle, um, we are familiar that with the sleep cycle that we cycle through nanogram and non sleep gram throughout the night. It's a very predictable, very reliable um, kind of set in stone. The first REM period occurs uh, much faster earlier in children at 55, 70 minutes. Uh, in actually in neonates, it comes even faster. Sometimes babies can even enter sleep through REM. And as we get older, the first REM uh, time, you know, the latency gets longer and longer. It's in adults about 19 to 120 minutes, the first REM comes. The first REM is the shortest. And as night progresses, the subsequent REM periods get longer. Most of the deep sleep occurs early. Most of the REM sleep occurs early in the morning. As we get, you know, progress through childhood, our sleep patterns change. So in babies, we are seeing the polyphasic sleep. They sleep um, and longer at night, but also have multiple naps during the day. As they get older, they just switch to like one nap and then a longer sleep at night. And as we get older, we just sleep at night, which is like a monophasic sleep. Though we would like to take you know, naps often uh, we are unable to because of our uh, work schedule. And similarly, non-REM and REM duration changes. Younger children have more REM and non-REM, which decreases as they get older. As you can see, the duration gets, you know, shorter as uh, sleep duration gets uh, shorter too. And then as we get older, the cycling also changes. The cycling is much faster in younger children and slows as they get older. Uh, this slide tells you, you know, babies have so much REM sleep, almost their 50% of their sleep is REM. And as we get older, it reduces to 25% in adolescence, 
20% adults and in older individuals is much lesser. Then uh, the REM and non-REM are very different in terms of what happens um, in those stages. There, in non-REM, there is reduced physiological activity, autonomic slowing, there's uh, thermal regulation going on in non-REM. There's very few episodic involuntary movements, very few rapid eye movements, and you really don't see much of the penile erection that happens in REM sleep. Um, there is reduced blood flow. Um, there is stone, decreased cerebral blood flow, uh, EEG is kind of more synchronized, there's heart rate and respiratory is more regular, um, upper airway resistance uh, increases, and though not as much as in RAM. And uh, because of the way the neurons connect with each other and the synchronized EEG, nocturnal seizures are more likely to occur in non-RAM compared to RAM. In RAM, um, you know, the most a significant uh, right, thing that we know about REM is the generalized muscle atonia. Most of the muscles are relaxed, including the ones in the upper airway. Um, there is increased cerebral blood flow. It almost feels like a person is awake, but still kind of sleeping. So most people confuse REM sleep to be the deep sleep, but it's actually the non-REM or the N3, which is the deepest stage of sleep. There is increased upper resistance, a lot of heart rate, respiratory variability. Uh, there is rapid eye movement, myoclonic twitches like that occur in REM. There is increased physiological activity. Um, there is altered uh, thermal regulation. And then of course we see the uh, penile erections that are characteristic of REM. Cardiac physiology also changes. Um, there is more sympathetic activity in phasic REM and then more parasympathetic activity in chronic REM. When it comes to breathing, you know, as pulmonologists, we're all interested in what happens to breathing when we're sleeping. Sleep is a potentially vulnerable state for the respiratory system. So there are some uh, breathing disorders that occur only during sleep. Uh, virtually all respiratory disorders are uh, worse during sleep than during wakefulness. And there are several reasons for this. Looking briefly uh, at respiratory control, we have the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group, and the pre boxinger complex has pacemaker properties that generate the respiratory rhythm. It then transmits signals to the upper airway um, muscles to open the airway and also the lower respiratory uh, pump muscles to uh, start breathing, and this kickstarts the breathing process and keeps going even without us being aware of it. Um, it's important to talk about upper airway when we're talking about sleep. So uh, pharynx, as we know, has different parts, nasopharynx, velopharynx, oro, and hypopharynx. It's uh, like a long tube with a mid-segment that contains multiple muscles. And this is where the air resistance increases during sleep because there is relaxation of these pharyngeal dilators when we are sleeping. And most of this obstruction or narrowing of the airway due to muscle relaxation occurs in the velopharynx as well as the oropharynx. So pharyngeal dilators are the axillary group muscles that maintain pharyngeal patency by tonic and phasic contractions during inspiration, both during wakefulness and sleep. And one of the most important muscles that's been studied and that uh, we know of is the genial glasses. So contraction of the genial glasses protrudes the tongue, increases the size of the airway, decreasing the collapsibility of the pharynx, and this get, you know, the this, this center that it, it modulates it's in the middle of from pharyngeal mechanoceptors. And these dilators uh, respond to hypercapnia and also negative intralineal pressure. So as you can see here, uh, the genial glasses, contraction of that, you know, decreases the size of the um, uh, tongue by pushing it forward, opening the airway patency here. Uh, we now actually have a, a therapeutic option of having an implant in the genial glasses that is be triggered with a magnet or a switch. And people who have difficulty using CPAP or BiPAP, you know, have, can have this implant placed in their tongue and use this to open their airway uh, during sleep. So now, you know, knowledge of this has helped us now have a therapeutic modality for treating sleep apnea. Our breathing changes during sleep. Um, our act when we lay down in supine position, the FRC and PLC are reduced. Uh, in when we fall asleep, the FRC reduces further, 
because of reduced chest wall lung, lung compliance, there is reduced uh, you know, relative hypotonia of the diaphragm, there is altered respiratory timing from the central pattern generator, so much so that our min minute ventilation decreases in REM and much more significantly in non-REM. Our tidal volume also decreases when we are sleeping uh, up to 16% ground REM and 25% in REM. There is reduced a lower compensation, uh, which causes more hyperventilation, hypercapnia. So our, our breathing system cannot respond to any stresses during sleep. Um, as we know, there is reduced FRC, there is reduced ventilator drive. Uh, the decrease in synchronization of dilators with diaphragmatic contraction can cause uh, airway obstruction. And children, because they have a faster respiratory rate and lower FRC, they can desaturate even with short pauses or short apneas uh, during sleep. Our breathing uh, response to high CO2 or oxygen also changes. So we have a you know, look at the response between increasing CO2 and ventilation. Um, we respond much better uh, with a much more acute uh, slope when we are awake. But when we fall asleep in non-REM and REM, this response to CO2 is much more, le much lesser compared to when we are awake. Similarly, um, with a reduced uh, oxygen uh, hypoxia, we have a, a real reduced response during non-REM and REM compared to when we're awake. So all of these factors play a role in um, when we're sleeping. Uh, we are healthy, we have, we have enough compensatory, enough redundancy to make sure that we don't desaturate or we don't have a raise in carbon dioxide. But when we are dizzy state, this really you know, affects uh, the person. Another important concept to talk about is uh, what we call as a relative hypoventilation. So once we fall asleep, our CO2 levels raise as because of the decreased minute ventilation that we talked about earlier. So the CO2 levels raise about two to eight millimeters um, of our wakefulness level. So when we're sleeping, we also have what we call an apneic threshold. So this we see even when we are awake. So if we have our CO2 reserve, if we hyperventilate, you know, then push the CO2 below the apneic threshold, we stop breathing. And then once the CO2 starts raising, you know, we start breathing again. But when in sleep, the gap between the this to the CO2 reserve and the apneic threshold is much shorter or much lesser. So even a small drop in CO2 can cause a person to go apneic. Uh, until the CO2 rises again. So this can happen when you have, you know, hyperventilation because of any reason, you know, it's an arousal or there's a side breath and this can push the CO2 down and cause an apneic episode. This we see if there's a uh, arousal during sleep. So you can see in this sleep study, there's an arousal here that causes uh, increased breathing and there's a central apnea because the CO2 is low and the body doesn't respond to low CO2 and doesn't start breathing. And the same mechanism happens in uh, chain stokes respiration where there is hyperventilation, blowing off CO2 causes apnea, CO2 rises and start ventilating again. So this pattern occurs all through the night in a person with uh, chain stokes breathing. Other thing to talk about in is uh, a con important concept to know is what we call the loop gain. So uh, our body has a system where uh, the CO2 being the main uh, driver of breathing uh, during sleep, the, the CO2 is an input and the ventilation is the output. So as long as the input and the output are proportional to each other, then you have a good system that is not overcompensating or undercompensating. But this is what you see in a normal loop gain. So there's a change in CO2, there's an appropriate response, and then the system becomes normal. But in a person with a high loop gain where the response is too much, so there's kind of more than one, then you have a narrow CO2 result. So even a small disturbance can cause the system to fluctuate a lot. And this is exactly what happens in a person with change of breathing uh, where the light loop gain is so high, it never can get back to normal because of the yo-yoing of the system. Um, we all have arousals from sleep uh, and it, they're annoying uh, because that is the sleep, but it's an important protective mechanism 
which actually opens your airway. So when there's an obstructive sleep apnea, the air arousal following it is actually opens your airway and it's helping you start breathing again. So as expected, you know, hypoxia, hypercapnia, increased airway resistance can influence arousal. And interestingly enough, hypoxia per se is a very poor stimulus for arousal. And studies have shown that individuals can remain sleeping even with oxygen as low as 70% in men, REM and non-REM. Compared, contrast, hypercapnia is a better stimulus for arousal. And if you have both hypercapnia and hypoxia, they, you have a much stronger response in you know, causing an arousal. So arousal, though annoying, are important in helping us reestablish our breathing uh, when there's an obstruction. So switching gears, um, you know, we talked about normal sleep cycles in children. As we get older, the young adults, the sleep pattern changes. The cycling is much slower. We have less non-REM uh, compared to children. And as we get older, the whole system gets even a weaker. And then you can see in adults, the, uh, you have a lot more periods when you're awake from sleep and, you know, kind of difficult to have deeper stages of sleep. You reduce REM, non-REM. You tend to spend more time in the lighter stages of sleep compared to um, younger people. So uh, this slide shows you what happens over time is that, you know, you uh, have a, in a system that is becoming weaker and weaker as time passes. So uh, our um, REM decreases over time, the slow way of sleep decreases over time. And as you get older, you tend to spend more time in one and two. Uh, and then this, um, what we call in sleep medicine is called a VASO or a wake after sleep onset. So you, that you have less of that when you're younger. So your sleep is more efficient, but as you get older, you have more periods when you're awake um, and your sleep you know, doesn't feel you're well refreshed um, at all. One of the things that we came to know um, more, you know, pretty recently is com that comes from uh, the phenomenal work from Mary Karskadon um, is that in teenagers, the sleep pattern changes, which leads to what we call as a perfect storm. Um, when children enter adults, there are changes that occur in their body that makes their circadian rhythm to change. So it gets delayed, as in they like to go to bed later and wake up later. But um, there is also uh, the psychosocial pressure. You know, the children, you know, when they're teenagers, they want to stay up late. They are on screen, they are social networking. And also they have a lot of homework. In, in the US, there's a lot of sports activities that happen in the evening. So they have a lot more busy evenings that doesn't let them go to sleep um, um, on time or actually pushes their bedtime. But the problem is they still have an early wake time. And most of the schools until recently used to have an earlier wake uh, start time for high schoolers. And this led to their sleep. Uh, actually, they're getting less sleep. So they increased the problems of, you know, dual delinquency and increased the risk of mental health disorders, increased accidents and number of things. And you know, knowledge of this helped us change the way things are being done. So now the American Academy of Pediatrics and also Sleep Academy has recommended that the schools change the start time for middle and high school students. So now elementary school kids go to school first and then the school starts later around 8 a.m. or 8.30 for middle and high school students. And this has helped a lot improving the overall health of the teenagers. So why is sleep important? And, you know, uh, why is it even necessary to focus so much on sleep? It's, you know, because we see a lot of sleep burden um, in children as well as adults. So 25% uh, of children uh, would have suffered some type of sleep problem at some point during their childhood. It could vary from bedtime resistance, um, not being able to sleep on their own and needing to sleep with mom or dad. Uh, and also primary sleep disorders, such as you know, sleep apnea or narcolepsy. And this has been shown remarkably consistently across different age groups. So yeah, whether it's preschool, um, school age children, adolescents, they all reported uh, sleep difficulties. And even adolescents, where it's actually very difficult to get information from, they also report that they have a lot of uh, sleep problems, such as nighttime awakenings, daytime sleepiness, not feeling refreshed from sleep, and needing to want to get more sleep. 
Um, sleep deprivation studies have shown that uh, with sleep deprivation, there is increased pain tolerance, lower seizure threshold, increased sympathetic activity, causing hypertension. There's also reduced cognitive performance, attention, working memory, executive functioning, decision-making skills. Your rest response time is slowed, so uh, you may cause uh, response slowly to, uh, you know, uh, and to uh, vehicles or cause vehicle accidents. And children often present with hyperactivity if they're sleep deprived. With sleep deprivation, there is increased hunger, appetite, a preference for salty, sweet, starchy food, which increases your weight, um, and an increase in IL-1, IL-6, CRP, TNF-alpha causes low resistant infections. So you're more likely to get sick if you're sleep deprived. You're more likely to have anxiety, depression, other disorders. Um, of course, you know, frequency of medical errors increase when um, residents or, you know, uh, students are sleep deprived, increases of uh, motor vehicle accidents. And when there is restoration of sleep, is always the N3 that increases first. So you're, when you're not sleeping well, you build a sleep debt, which is mostly in the form of loss of N3. So when you start sleeping better, your N3 rebounds and then uh, the REM catches up. So um, there are a number of studies that looked at what happens with um, chronic sleep deprivation, that is shorter survival, increased pain threshold, impaired memory, uh, poor focus, greater utilization of healthcare, workplace errors, increased inflammation and risk of chronic disease um, as well. Um, we talked some of uh, this in earlier slides. So your lack of sleep can make you age much faster. You know, your sleep deprivation makes you age by three to five years. There is increased risk of uh, depression, irritability, anxiety, uh, fuzzy thinking, uh, poor immune function, increased uh, blood pressure, heart disease. We are more likely to catch a cold, so it can lead to uh, chronic sleep deprivation. So um, kind of switching gears, looking at what, what is normal sleep in children? So when you're looking at a sleep study, you know, what is normal? So, you know, we, and it, you, we kind of mostly, one of the most important things that we look at when we're looking at a sleep study is what we call as apnea hypopnea index, which reflects how many times your airway collapses during sleep. So uh, we categorize it as mild, moderate, severe. So anything less than one is considered normal which is very different from adults. Um, so we apply adult criteria when they're more than 18 years of age. So it's important to know the distinction between the numbers of adults and children um, uh, because they're categorized in different ways. So when you do look at a sleep study in a normal child, you know, who is healthy, so we should not be seeing apneas or hypopneas. Uh, there is some flow limitation, but it's not significant. Oxygen should not drop below 90%. Or respiratory rate, minute ventilation decreases, um, but um, it should not uh, raise our CO2 significantly, though there's, as I mentioned, there's CO2 rises uh, to a small amount. There is mild increase in, moderate, modest increase in upper airway resistance. There is a small decrease in oxygen saturation. Brief central apneas, particularly in REM sleep, are common, but obstructive apneas are never seen in a normal child. When you look at um, infants, you know, we don't have a lot of studies looking at what is normal in infants. So one of the studies that were done in our institution was looking, uh, we looked at uh, sleep studies about 30 to 40 uh, normally developed infants with no medical problems. We found that their apnea hypnopnea index was actually much higher than what we would expect in a normal child. So uh, this is really important to kind of recognize that, you know, their mean AHI can be much higher compared to older children. We still don't know what's the significance of this and whether this actually causes in a neurodevelopmental problem, but kind of important thing to know that their sleep efficiency is much lower and their AHI can be much higher compared to older kids. And when we looked at the study, we, you know, one of the things I want to highlight is that often we measure entire carbon dioxide during sleep study. So you can see in an older child, you can see there's a good plateau of the CO2 uh, when they are breathing, but in infants, you don't see that plateau and they're breathing it much faster. So when you're measuring CO2 during sleep, it can be inaccurate uh, because of these reasons in infants. So we tend to use a transcutaneous CO2 monitoring 
in babies um, when we're doing sleep studies. So um, to finish up, uh, I just wanted to show you what should be the kind of normal sleep duration in children. Um, as you can see, babies, young, young children need a lot more sleep, uh, 12 to 16 hours, including naps uh, in four to 12 months. And children one to two years, 11 to 14 hours, uh, three to five years, they're still napping in this age group. Um, they need about 10 to 13 hours. And usually they stop napping by the time they enter you know, kindergarten or first grade. Uh, they still need a lot of sleep at night, nine to 12 hours. And even adolescents, eight to 10 hours. Um, so often, um, you know, children don't get enough sleep and this causes a lot of problems. So, um, you know, as sleep doctors and, you know, we emphasize this importance of sleep uh, duration and often parents are surprised that, you know, they didn't know about this. So I think we as pediatricians in general, you know, should take every opportunity to make sure that our children are getting enough hours of sleep, which will help their health in, a, in the long run. And I will stop at this stage and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harish, for your brilliant uh, talk on sleep. Uh, there are several uh, DM students from PGI as well as from uh, Ames, uh, Delhi and Jodhpur who are connected to us. So you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. And those who are on YouTube can uh, write their questions on the YouTube. Uh, just to start with uh, Dr. Harish, uh, as you said, uh, in adolescents, the sleep problem occurs because of their uh, late sleeping behavior. And uh, you know, many times these children are these days on the devices, on screens. And what we see is that uh, many of these children are not able to sleep after that. Uh, it seems that it interferes somehow with the sleep uh, physiology. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Absolutely, you're right. Uh, I think it's a very good observation. So, um, you know, the, the neurons that I was uh, alluding to earlier in the retina, the photosensitive neurons, they are very sensitive to the blue light spectrum that these devices emit. So there's a lot of things that we know how this uh, affects. So these, they have an affinity for blue light. So the blue light, you know, uh, affects the circadian rhythm much stronger than other spectrums of light. So this less led to, you know, people using blue light filters and, you know, reducing the brightness, uh, but still it affects sleep a lot. So what we recommend is, you know, turn off all the devices, including your iPhone, iPad, and iPad is one of the worst devices mm, you can yes. imagine uh, that can affect sleep. So even Kindle, you know, anything that, you know, and you know, we, these days we have TVs that emit a lot of light. So it's important to reduce exposure to light as we get closer to bedtime. Um, so I think some of what problems that we have with sleep is, you know, man-made is just because we have, we now we're taking all these devices into our bedroom. You know, most of us have TV in the bedroom and take this phone to our bedroom and we're still in the bed looking at this phone. So we recommend that we turn off all these devices at least an hour before bedtime. So that helps our system circadian rhythm to kind of wind down and have melatonin kick in because, you know, light is a much stronger stimulus for the circadian rhythm and light exposure suppresses melatonin. So as long as you're on these devices, your melatonin secretion is not gonna kick in and it's not gonna help you drift off to sleep. So it, that effect of light lasts for a long time. So really important to turn it off as early as you can in the evening and you know, resort to doing something much you know, nicer, like you know, reading a book or a magazine. Or... Listening to music or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, like you could probably use your other senses, you know, like listening and uh, that would be better. Absolutely. And in children, of course, uh, I think tactile mm -hmm. senses are also very important for small children, especially, you know, the mother's touch and other things are important. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, now AAP has recommendation that, you know, children, younger children should not be exposed to these devices and there should be a screen time limit of one to two hours and not more than that. But 
I think, you know, the ubiquity and uh, easier availability of these tablets, they're getting much cheaper. So every family has them. There's more internet access everywhere. So I think it's really a problem that we have created for ourselves. And uh, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. Uh, there was a question I wanted to ask you about adenosine. As you said that, uh, you know, as adenosine levels rise uh, after wakefulness or uh, there is a correlation between adenosine levels and sleep depth as such. We have been studying this uh, biomarker for asthma and we find that uh, adenosine is also very important in development of hyperreactivity and TH2 responses. Do you see any correlation remote or near between these two things? Because we know that uh, exacerbation of asthmas do occur in children who are you know, sleep deprived or have emotional problems, behavioral problems because of that. Yeah, I think there's, um, uh, there's a, I think it was a very good correlation. I've not looked at the, that correlation, I've not seen asthma, you know, um, I've not really come across mm -hmm. any studies, I'm not, but, you know, it, it makes sense because, you know, uh, if you had, there's, you know, asthma, you know, in, in inflammatory state and the lack of sleep is also considered an inflammatory state. Yes. So, you, even, you know, you look at CRP and other markers, people who are sleep deprived, a higher level of CRP, uh, particularly the high, highly sensitive CRP. So I think they all go together. So, you know, uh, sleep, um, OSA, lack of, you know, asthma, they're all like kind of feed off each other. And it's important to, you, you know, improve sleep. Um, again, asthma can also, fully control asthma can also affect sleep. So. Okay. There is a you know vicious cycle you know and the inter correlation between the two. So I think improving sleep helps um, a number of things. I, I, could, I could see this as a potential area of research. Probably we can study this. Uh, there's a question uh, in the chat box by Dr. Ketan. Uh, that we sometimes see patients with strider with aggravation in sleep, deep sleep, like strider getting aggravated in deep sleep. Does this help us in localizing the site of airway involvement? Good question. Um, uh, deep sleep is, I, I think, you know, you're probably taught, and it's difficult to sometimes say it's, it's a non rem or REM. I think most of the time, I think it's likely to happen in REM sleep because, you know, the airway resistance increases much more and the pharyngeal dilators are not as active in REM sleep compared to non-REM. So it's most likely to occur in REM. So when you're looking at Strider, you, you know, it could be uh, depending on inspiratory, expiratory, you know, where it is, is extrathoracic or intrathoracic. Most likely in a child, it's likely to be, you know, at the extrathoracic or supraglottic level. Um, in children, you know, we often do what's called a DEES or a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So they come into the OR and then we uh, sedate them um, deep enough for us not to, uh, you know, sedate them too much, but light enough for us to induce sleep, similar to something natural sleep. And then we then do a endoscopy or bronchoscopy to locate the size of the obstruction. So... Um, you know, the protocols for these, these is available online in many of the studies, so it can be easily replicated um, even in India. So I think this will help to localize the level of abstraction uh, and then help you uh, determine, you know, what is the surgical procedure that will be helpful. This is something like FEES, like uh, functional endoscopy, which we do yeah. for the upper airway obstruction. And, uh, yeah, so in this one, we use, uh, you know, sedation. Yeah, he's written that we currently have a 13-year-old child who has very loud strider in sleep and has subclotting narrowing on scoping. So during sleep, of course, as you said, that relaxation of muscles leads to, uh, I think, greater obstruction. So, yeah, when we are awake, you know, there are a lot of compensatory mechanisms um, that help us keep our airway open, you know, have better ventilation. But when we are sleeping, all these compensatory mechanisms are, you know, taken away. Um, so we have much more likelihood of uh, airway obstruction and you know, ventilation problems. So uh, I had a question that if you have to develop sleep as a specialty, uh, you know, in India, we know that several of our pulmonary programs have associated sleep labs and have, uh, you know, sleep studies as part of their program. Mm -hmm. 
do you think it should be part of that or sleep should be an independent kind of a speciality because it does have neurological uh, connection as well as respiratory and behavioral problems as well. So how much part do you think pulmonary program should have uh, devoted to sleep? Yeah, in the US we've been, um, uh, pulmonologists and neurologists have been fighting about this for a long time. Um, uh, actually most of the sleep problems historically was originally started by psychiatrists. Um, but then, you know, their pulmonologists, uh, uh, neurologists, even family practice, a lot of people, you know, um, think that, okay, you know, we should be uh, managing sleep. But as a pulmonologist, I think most of the problems that we see in children are respiration or breathing related. And it's important for sleep labs to have input from both. I think primarily pulmonologists because most of the problems are related to either, you know, pulmonary problem that is worsening in sleep or like a sleep apnea that like occurs excluding exclusively in sleep. So of course, you know, we also see uh, neurological uh, problems, but not so much in children. So in adult world, they see a lot more neurological problems related to sleep, you know, like a REM behavior disorder or, you know, restless leg syndrome. So there's a lot more neurological related or mood related disorders that you see in adult sleep medicine. But in children, predominantly it is uh, either insomnia or uh, it's obstructive sleep apnea. So I think, you know, as pulmonologists, we think we can do a better job, um, but we like to have input from neurologists and psychiatrists. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Manvi asks, what is the sedation used for sleep endoscopy in children? at your center, is anesthesia backup warranted? Yes, um, uh, we use a, a drug called Dex. Um, it, Dex it's kind of hard. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the one. It's hard to, hard to say. I, I had to sometimes practice that. Like that's the one that, hmm. yeah, that's the one we use. Um, and it's always done by, mostly done by ENT in our center. And then, you know, there's anesthesiologists who are monitoring it. So we use anesthesiologists to actually kind of monitor the sedation and then the airway, and then the ENT does the bronchoscopy. So I think we've exhausted uh, most of the questions. There's something on... Uh, there are a couple more questions. On YouTube? Yeah, there's a question from... There's a yeah. question from Ketan. Um, yes, uh, there's a question uh, by Ketan again. Uh, we often have children with syndromic obesity or generalized hypotonia with florid clinical features of OSA. What would a formal would a, what would a formal sleep study add to these situations? With the sleep study, you know, you will be able to determine what's the severity of the OSA, uh, whether there is hypoventilation, whether there is hypoxemia. And of course, you know, we um, titrate uh, CPAP or BiPAP using sleep studies. So we, uh, these children come into our sleep lab, we um, fit them with a mask and then see if the mask fit is good. And then we uh, then use the machine uh, through the night and adjust pressures. We have protocols for CPAP, BiPAP. We adjust the pressures all through the night, uh, you know, making changes uh, in response to their apneas and CO2. So sleep study is very helpful um, to, um, titrate and get them the right pressures that you need for managing their OSA. What is the effect of serotonin? Which sleep questionnaire is best to screen children with sleep disorders? This is a question by Dr. Jagdish Goel. He is uh, at Ames Jodhpur. Good question. So there are many sleep questionnaires um, that are available. I think there is not a single one that would uh, encompass everything and get you all the information that you need. So there is uh, PISCI with a pit for, uh, sleep questionnaire. That's one of the things that we use the most, but most places have their own, um, and we at our center have their own sleep questionnaire that um, asks what are the sleep problems in general, uh, just to get an idea of the, how the family uh, looks at the sleep problem as well. And Sometimes specifically we use whiskey to get more information uh, about how sleep quality is affected uh, in a particular child. Another question, uh, how much sleep inducing drugs affect sleep pattern and results? 
Yes, it depends on the individual drugs. Um, I have a little handout that I use looking at, you know, how different drugs affect different, you know, how much sedation they cause versus affect REM versus non-REM. So um, every drug is different um, in how much uh, they affect different stages of sleep as well as, you know, affecting the sleep efficiency or duration. So it's, it's a lot, um, you know, variation in uh, how different drugs you know, um, affect sleep. So um, I can forward you that uh, handout that I have and uh, I can, I'm happy to share that. Another question was on YouTube about the relation of serotonin to sleep. What's the relationship of serotonin? As a... So serotonin uh, has, is placed in a, like one of the, like a mild to moderate role. It's not like you know it functions in in relation to other systems but now um you know our, our knowledge about serotonin and you know, how it functions is increasing so actually in uh, there's in some of the new drugs that are coming up in narcolepsy are actually serotonin based so it are being used to um modulate serotonin function to help patients stay awake so it, it's uh, being looked at in much more detail now uh, with increasing knowledge and uh, you know, we have now medications that help. So, so it plays a role, but per se, it's not one of the, the major neurotransmitters or systems that affects you. Then uh, is there a relation between nocturnal worsening of asthma symptoms and sleep? Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, as we talk, lack of sleep uh, and, and, you know, there's a correlation between sleep apnea and asthma too. So I think, you know, when you optimize sleep, you will optimize um, asthma as well. So nocturnal worsening of asthma is, is because there's a circadian rhythm in your airway that makes your airway constriction much happen much more at night compared to during the day. So that's the reason why Many patients start to have, you know, more worsening asthma early in the morning, just because of the circadian rhythm in the airway uh, constriction pattern. So, there's a clear correlation uh, with nocturnal worsening, not only with inflammation but also with the circadian rhythm uh, of how uh, airway, uh, you know, constriction occurs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question was why SSRI cause insomnia? Yeah, good. It's a good question. So SSRIs um, have, you know, in some patients they can cause insomnia. I mean, in some, they actually can promote sleep. So it is very variable and an individual person can respond in different ways. Um, a, in some patients, if given early in the evening, it can actually help them fall asleep. So, but if you're given closer to bedtime, it can increase, you know, nightmares or parasomnias. So it, we always look at how an individual patient would respond. Um, and most of the patients uh, that I see tend to take SSRIs in the evening. In some patients, it can cause insomnia. So if they say that, okay, I am not able to fall asleep, do you recommend taking it in the morning? But most of our patients take it in the evening. And of course, SSRI, one of the big effects of SSRI is actually reducing REM sleep. They suppress REM. Um, so it's important um, to know that because if we are looking at the you know, diagnosis of narcolepsy, they need to come off that medication to help us diagnose narcolepsy. But an interesting thing about SSRI is, particularly Prozac, uh, is it causes REM-like eye movements um, when you're sleeping. So you can mistake them for having REM sleep, but it's actually not REM sleep per se. So I think we have exhausted the questions. Uh, since this is the first in the series of sleep talks that you're going to take. So thank you very much for setting up this stage for uh, some knowledge regarding sleep architecture, physiology and regulation. Uh, I think you will take up uh, sleep-related disorders uh, in, in subsequent lectures, which we will be fixing up soon. And it's, it's been a pleasure listening to you after a long time, uh, Dr. Harish. It's, uh, it's a very good opportunity for all of us to listen about uh, these problems because 
Uh, we do not have many uh, sleep labs operating uh, right now in uh, all over the country for children, at least in India. And it's very important that we become aware about sleep disorders in children because uh, they really help in, uh, in, in dealing with these problems because they are rampant and uh, they do affect the quality of life as well as disease occurrence in these patients. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming live early in the morning uh, for all of us. Although it's a very convenient time over here. I hope you did not have much of sleep deprivation because of your talk. Uh, I mean, thank I had, you so I had much. My, I had my coffee in the morning, so that right. helps. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you.